Coming up on this week's show, grab the popcorn as we go behind the scenes of the game based on the controversial new Transformers movie. And Resistance is futile as Pokemon prepares to invade Europe all over again. But first, buckle up and join us for a spot of filthy mud wrestling. Way back in 1995, the original Sega Rally left its rubber-burning rivals eating dust, introducing the sensation of racing across different surfaces to the arcade experience. We're here at Racing Studio in the UK. A new team has been specifically hand-picked to recapture the glories of old and deliver a new version of the classic Sega Racer. And the innovation this time is as clear as mud. mud, snow, gravel, sand, a liberal sprinkling of water and a pack of cars quite literally ploughing their way through at breakneck speed. Colin McRae's latest might call itself dirt, Sony's MotorStorm churned up its terrain largely for show, but now Sega Rally threatens to deliver on the next gen promise with creamy mud baths that are an integral gameplay feature, not just graphical showboating, mud for it. <laughs> Sega's Racing Studio was formed last year to be a driving developer of all the talents. Its crew handpicked from the pit lanes of Codemasters, Criterion, Rockstar and more. Its primary function is to go into Sega's showroom and retune its arcade racing superstars, one classic at a time. Sega Rally, the most successful of all the Japanese firm's racers, has taken pole position. Anyway, we've had the sales pitch for over a year now, and frankly, we need a very good reason to travel all the way up to a business park in Solihull. Happily, four playable courses, single-player Xbox 360 demo units, and a bank of interlinked racing pods for full six-player competition are just a ticket. Oh, and yes, what you're seeing here is the world's first direct feed in-game footage, captured for your viewing pleasure. But before we get too comfortable and start crunching those gears of war, let's have a nosy about the place. So through here is the nerve centre of Sega Rally's development, where right now the mechanics are fiddling around under the game's bonnet. So let's go and have a bit of a fiddle ourselves. We'll get onto the geeky defamation stuff in a minute. First, we need tracks to mash up. And true to the spirit of the original, Mother Nature's extremities have been called upon to provide the staging. And we put together these mood boards, and the designers and the artists will then have a lot of series of meetings to establish the correct theme and uh, the look that we're trying to achieve on each level. And then what will happen is we move into the, the 3D world, and. Um, start to, it's an example of a building that's on tropical. Um, these buildings will then be placed in 3D Studio Max alongside the track and the idea is to create as much detail next to the track where the player is and then sort of have less detail the further away you go from the, the, the track. From here it's a case of splashing on all those visual details and gameplay elements and you have yourself one tasty looking rally game. It's a similarly intensive process that brings the cars themselves out of the garage and onto the track. Everything has to be painstakingly cross-checked with each manufacturer, which can turn into a lengthy rally of approvals tennis where every last detail, right down to the amount of space around logos, has to be spot on. Bet that's fun. But the studio can take comfort from the fact that it's compiling an extensive resource for the future. We do that for the modelling, mapping, texturing, um, high-res bonnets, high-res wheels, um, mud, snow, dust, um, anything that, any process that we're putting into the cars, doing for the cars, we'll, we'll document. Um, and basically what it's done, it's given us like a, an insight, you know, a group of, of documents which uh, are blueprints for everything that we'll do from now and, and for other projects, basically. 
So, got the tracks and got the cars. So now we just need that, if you'll excuse the pun, groundbreaking technology. Well, started doing this tractive farm technology based mostly on earth and mud. But then we have found out we had a lot of unexpected side effects and things we could do with this. We could do snow now, we could do uh, skid marks. When you're actually driving uh, on the on tarmac, it's leave, it leaves rubber and increasing your grip level. We can do uh, cracks on the on the asphalt, so you have really holes that can be can be created by the artist uh, or the designers, depending on what they're trying to do with that track. Puddles as well, they evolve over time. Maybe you've seen it on Tropical One when you're driving the first lap, the, the puddle is fairly big, but not that much. But after three laps, it becomes wider and much, much bigger making the track, well, the track behaves differently, the time, your timings become different. It sure looks impressive, but for once there's substance behind the PR spiel. Every little groove in the mud, every skid mark on the tarmac changes gameplay. You can see here how first the tyres scramble the surface, then the suspension delicately feels its way across. As a result, no two laps are the same, and by the end of each race, the courses are violently churned up, requiring quick wits and specific tactics to find the best line. And if you're playing with a force feedback wheel or a vibration pack 360 controller, you'll feel every single bump. Pre Sega, studio head Guy Wilde was a key figure in the McRae series which coincidentally took its inspiration from the original Sega Rally. It's all come full circle, yeah, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite nice. Um, we, we played Sega Rally lots, we were playing it on the Saturn at that time. Um, and, and really it was just the handling, it was the core handling dynamics of that game, it was so playable. And I think it was that, that was what we wanted to capture with, with, with Colin McRae, it, it was a more realistic game, but it was, it was definitely using Sega Rally as the original inspiration. And while us lazy journalists will toss around comparisons with dirt and motor storm willy-nilly, this heritage is a key point of difference according to Wilde. I think we're very different. I think we're, we're, we're at a different end of the spectrum, really. Um, a, a lot of those games are quite, are quite gritty and are quite real. Um, a, a, lot, a lot of them uh, are trying to simulate the sport um, quite accurately. And as I say, we're, we're, we're very much trying to position ourselves as something that's much more playable, much more accessible, uh, much more fun. Back in the gaming room, losing to Eurogamer's Tom Bramwell gets very boring very quickly, believe me. It's in this context you understand that we had no other choice but to take him outside and talk to him about the game. But the, the closer you get to it, the more you come to appreciate its subtleties. The track deformation stuff, obviously a lot of fuss was kicked up, kicked up about, uh, about that when it came to Motorstorm, but in Motorstorm's case it proved to be largely a visual thing. With this you can really feel the difference. So there's a, there's a great range of subtlety um, to the racing strategies you can bring to these tracks. They have a lot of hidden depths you'll pick out racing lines that initially you weren't thinking of. You'll find ways through the sequences of corners. Um, and obviously that's true of a lot of racing games, but in this case, the accessibility is there as well. So you're initially still capable of competing and it's still fun. I mean, we had great fun with the force feedback chairs in particular, but um, once you move on to that second level, that sort of second depth, you start to appreciate uh, the, the levels of um, effort that have gone into this. Sega Rally will be wallowing in the gaming mud like a drugged up Glastonbury hippie on 360, PS3, PC and PSP this autumn. Is that a monster in your pocket or are you just pleased to see me? So come on, own up, are you one of the owners of the 150 million copies of Pokemon games already sold around the world? Or have you somehow stubbornly refused to be charmed by the second biggest selling game franchise in history after Mario? Twelve years since the Japanese release of the original red and green versions, Pokemon has so remorselessly, resoundingly confounded expectations that even the most vehement Poké hater has given up predicting its demise. And Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, the fourth generation of the core role-playing game, have already smashed sales records east and west ahead of the European invasion next month. But if the world seems to be drowning in tacky Pokemon merchandise, dodgy movies, comics, shops, TV shows, trading cards and God knows what else, 
It's all because at this centre, sorry haters, Pokemon's just a rock solid adventure game. Addictive collection based goals and trading elements, guaranteed kiddie crack. But the dizzying scale of the RPGs, the brilliantly balanced gameplay and the irresistible charm of the world have won it a huge audience amongst hardcore gamers too. Now, depending on how you feel about Pokemon, Tsunakazu Ishihara is either a gaming hero or a pernicious villain. As president and CEO of the Pokemon Company, he's been there right from the start, producing the original red and green titles and turning a quirky adventure based on insect collection into an unstoppable global phenomenon. The secret of its popularity is that Pokemon has always provided a very surprising experience each time, and there's always so much to discover in every new game. One of the most important things for us is to make games that are better than Mario. <laughs> Though Pokemon creator Game Freak is a separate developer, its ties with Nintendo Japan are strong. And it turns out that a certain chap over at NCL played quite an important role in the Pocket Monsters phenomenon. The fact that we can come up with something this exciting on DS is owing to the very close and unique relationship we have with Nintendo. Going back to Red and Green, it was Mr. Miyamoto's idea that it should appear as two games. The original concept of collecting creatures was the brainchild of colleague Satoshi Tajiri. And even back in 1995, Ishihara knew that they had something special on their hands. When I looked at the game and played it, Seeing that you can exchange Pokemon with your friends, this was the moment that I really felt this would be a big thing. Diamond and Pearl mark the long-awaited debut of the RPG series on DS. If Japan and the US are anything to go by, they're probably going to do alright in Europe. The big addition for Pokemaniacs, of course, is full Wi-Fi play. Exchanging Pokemon with your friends, having battles with them and chatting is something I always envisaged from the very beginning. It's really hard to come up with new Pokemon. As you know, there are over 100 new ones in Diamond and Pearl, and it almost feels to the development team that they're constantly giving birth to new ones. With Battle Revolution on Wii arriving this summer, Pokemon, love it or hate it, is all set to dominate the rest of 2007. So if you've never played it before, maybe now's the time to give in and give the little guys a go. It's 10 years since the first Pokemon, and now I hear of children and parents playing together. So those that grew up with Pokemon, their kids are now playing it. I find that very moving. Oh, and before we go, we've got to ask. Come on, who's your favourite Pokemon? <laughs> it's a question I get asked a lot. The one that's called Nasi in Japanese, Executor in English. Diamond and Pearl, which scored a Poketastic 9 out of 10 in Eurogamer's review, hit Europe on July the 27th. Oh, weep, grown, or weep, ninny, bon. Which, as any fan of the classic 1986 Transformers movie will tell you, is the universal greeting. Well, later this month, we'll be greeting a brand new Transformers film, fresh from the greasy palms of Hollywood. And guess what? Amazingly, there's a game to tie in with it, which is being developed here behind me at Traveller's Tales in the UK, the team behind the magnificent Lego Star Wars series. But we'll be finding out exactly what's involved in the transformation from big screen to small. Few toys have captured the imaginations of young men of a certain age quite like Transformers. And despite being created explicitly to fleece us, or rather our parents out of their hard-earned, let's be honest, they were just cool. But the cult status of the range owes a great deal to the iconic Japanese cartoon, notably the 1986 theatrical release Transformers the Movie. 
cast included such greats as Leonard Nimoy, Eric Idle, Judd Nelson, and in his final movie role, Citizen Kane director Orson Welles as the planet gobbling Unicron. This, for our generation, is how we remember the galactic struggle between Autobots and Decepticons. 21 years later, like many aging stars of the silver screen, they've had a bit of work done. Director Michael Bay's 2007 reimagining uses the full force of ILM's cutting edge special effects technology to create robots of bewildering scale and detail, quite unlike their chiseled, colourful forebears. Unsurprisingly, it's provoked the type of furious internet debate normally reserved for Eurogamer reviews of Halo. It's probably Japanese. The game of the film has been entrusted to Traveller's Tales. Established in 1990, their first title was the tasty Amiga platformer Leander. But it wasn't until 2005, with the release of LEGO Star Wars, that the studio achieved global recognition. With Transformers the game, the challenge is not just in attempting to remain faithful to the movie's megabucks eye candy, but also satisfying both the diehards and a new generation of Transformers fans, which we'll call Trannies for short. You, you tend to find that there's a lot of uh, of people who still really, you know, really care about the franchise, and they've, you know, they've been into it for so long since they were kids, and they've got a very clear vision ahead of how things are. Um, Obviously with the movie, the movie's going in a different direction. We've just got to make sure that we do justice to the, the people who love the old, you know, the old style as well. To do this, the team has plundered the Hasbro archives to pack the game with Easter eggs aimed squarely at miserable change-resisting geeks like us. So we've tried to include a lot of, uh, you know, G1 and Lockables. We've got the old Megatron, the old Optimus from the cartoons, exactly those kind of models that you can download and unlock. And we've got some G1 skins for, for the new character models as well. So we've got the new models with the old skins on and stuff, which actually works. It doesn't sound like it does, but for those characters, like, I think Starscream's one like that, and you know, it works to treat. But in keeping with capturing the key moments from the new movie, a new generation of robots in disguise was required. Um, basically, the process involved taking reference materials, you can see on the right-hand side here from Hasbro, and uh, modelling it and texturing it as accurately as we as we possibly could. Transformers characters are very complex just by their nature. It's just hundreds of small components, mechanical components, obviously, that have come from the vehicles. So this is the finished result. Obviously, when you're modelling, you're modelling in uh, polygons. So here's the wireframe. And there's the textured, finished article. Once a 3D model of the bot's ready, it's over to the animators to bring it to life. I guess one of the uh, important uh, issues is actually getting, uh, you know, some combat, proper combat moves. So having these two characters, I can then uh, animate the character and make sure that he'll hit both, both characters. And then, you know, I do a a combination of three movements which are animated in one and then eventually what we'll do is is that same same movement will get uh, broken down into different sections which would correspond to different button presses. Then of course there's the small matter of the transformation itself and if you'll forgive me there's no way I can get through the show without doing it. My main character on the game was uh, Bone Crusher thing about the uh, transformations in game is they all have to happen pretty quickly because the player wants to you know get right into the action straight away so it's all about getting it all all done you know really quickly and, and they have to keep moving as well. Now all they need is somewhere to transform in. The movie's alien invasion angle means Earth is the main set for Michael Bay's Robot Wars. Again, assets from the film have been shared with Traveller's Tales, but there's only one planet that matters to us trannies. As a level artist, we uh, create all the scenery from ground up, from the concept work that we receive from uh, Activision uh, and ILM. Here I have a, uh, a building from Cybertron, which was uh, given to us from the, uh, the concept work of ILM. A lot of shapes and things are pre-made primitively, which helps us uh, achieve the model that we want to make quite efficiently. ILM use very, very high-res models for us to uh, 
get the graphics to work on all the next-gen consoles, we have to uh, limit the amount of poly use and uh, texture resolution so that things can fit on the PlayStation 2 as well as the 360 and all the next-gen consoles. Once all the battlegrounds and bots are there, it's up to the rest of the team to go make a game out of it. If you can sort of imagine the movie being broken down into beat points, so you've got like this focal point here, this focal point here, we still want to include them so you've got a point of reference with the movie. But, you know, if you win as Decepticons, then we want you to have the nice reward, the nice plot going off the Decepticon path. Um, you know, and then to, to show the player ultimately this is what the Decepticons are after, this is what they want to happen at the end. Um, and we've got a great outro by Blur, which I think does that more than enough justice. Blur is the studio responsible for bookending the game with two spectacular and exclusive CGI sequences. And in a further move to ensure authenticity, original Transformers writer Flint Dilly joined the project as a key advisor. So he was able to say, no, this is what would happen, this is what they would do. So we had a really good, you know, we, we knew that what we were doing fit with the license, it fit with the franchise, we weren't going to do something completely off kilter that nobody, and, you know, the real hardcore fans would be like, what was this? So, yeah, it was good to have him on board. There's quite a few people who are... Uh, it's kind of a dream come true for them to work on this game, um, you know, and uh, and they, they've they've proven it by putting the work in and uh, producing some really cool stuff. So, if you thought transforming the toy Megatron into a gun was complicated, try going from this to this to this. Whether the game will get its Hollywood happy ending or end up as a transformation too far will be revealed on Eurogamer.net soon. One shall stand, one shall fall.